The good news was to be preached in all the inhabited earth, according to Jesus' words at Matthew 24, 14. The Bible records the Acts of the Apostles in the first century. Today, the faithful and discreet slave class in modern times has often published historical narratives regarding the work in general, and sometimes more specific areas. Have you ever wondered about our local home territory? Jehovah's Witnesses today can move almost anywhere in Minnesota and find a kingdom hall nearby. So when and how did it penetrate into our area? Who were the first ones to receive the early literature? How quickly did it grow? I have attempted to thoroughly trace the development of the work here in the Twin Cities. The work in greater Minnesota is somewhat tied into this narrative, but that would be too large a task to document, although much is known. So I've limited this effort to the Twin Cities and surrounding areas. It would be logical that the greater number of early witnesses would be in this most populated region. Those who presently do or have lived in the Twin Cities of Minnesota will find this a fascinating journey into the past. This is our theocratic heritage and we should treasure it. It is interesting to pause and try to fully comprehend the times surrounding these earliest years of Zion's Watchtower. Minnesota received statehood only 21 years previous, in 1858. There were still Indian wars being fought on the plains of Minnesota and the Dakota Territory. Telephone service was in its infancy, and the telegram was the common way to communicate over long distances. The electric light bulb was invented in 1879, but was not widely available because electric service was not generally available. Transportation was still horse-driven, although railroads were building at a feverish pace. People lit their homes with oil lamps, heated with coal or wood. The United States had only recently emerged from a civil war. The rest of the world was still ruled by centuries-old monarchies and aristocracies. But people tended to be more knowledgeable of the Bible and recognized its value. Many Bible students were of the mindset that the return of Christ was imminent. This led to the Adventist movement beginning in the early 1800s. Among them were George Storrs, Henry Grew, and others of greater or lesser note who were publishing pamphlets and various periodicals throughout the 1800s. Eventually, secular historians would categorize Charles Taze Russell in this group. Born in 1852, he began to make a diligent search for the truth in his mid-teens and soon began to organize Bible study groups in his hometown of Allegheny, Pennsylvania, now a part of Pittsburgh. His search put him in contact with many of those previously mentioned. He and his associates, however, quickly discerned certain Bible truths that stumbled most then and today, and which quickly distanced them from other groups including most of the various Adventist groups. Key among these long hidden truths was the understanding that Christ would return invisibly. This resulted from a study of Matthew 24, 3, with the aid of the newly published work, The Emphatic Diaglot, an interlinear Bible that was first printed in 1865 and used the word presence instead of the common rendering coming to translate the Greek word parousia, after all, a spirit creature could be present without being seen, right? This led to the publication of Brother Russell's first booklet, entitled The Object and Manner of Our Lord's Return in 1877. 50,000 copies were printed. This was two years prior to the beginning of Zion's Watchtower. Another key understanding was the true condition of the dead, that the dead do not possess a soul, they're only sleeping and awaiting a resurrection. Also adding a sense of urgency to the work was the understanding that the Gentile times would end in 1914. This was not an invention, as some opposers would have us believe, of Brother Russell. Rather, he had been convinced of this by many others who had also been examining the prophecies. Brother Russell contributed an article to George Storr's Bible Examiner, in 1876 on this topic. By the late 1870s, Russell was the co-editor 
to the Rochester, New York-based The Herald of the Morning. His associate was N. H. Barber. They collaborated on the book The Three Worlds, or Plan of Redemption, in 1877. The first subscribers to Zion's Watchtower were individuals who had been subscribing to the Herald of the Morning. Russell had assisted Mr. Barber for a time in getting this journal out in the several months just prior to July of 1879 when the first issue of Zion's Watchtower was printed. He contributed both money and articles for publication until a separation came about over the doctrine of the ransom. Russell felt that to truly support the truth, he could not just simply withdraw from Barber, but he must publish another journal. At first he sent out Zion's Watchtower to those on the subscriber list of the Herald of the Morning, and also possibly the Bible Examiner, which was published by George Storrs. Russell wrote that he felt George Storrs had been a powerful influence on him. Most of the readers of these journals would have lived in the populated areas in the New England states, where Adventism had been growing since the days of William Miller in the early 1800s. But the railroads were opening up new land out west. They reached the Twin Cities in 1867. People soon followed to seek their fortunes and create new financial empires, or simply to seek adventure. Soon, copies of the fledgling magazine and other Watchtower Society publications were turning up in the far-flung regions of the new territories. The earliest reference to this area of the United States in Watchtower literature was an item which appeared in the March 1883 issue of Zion's Watchtower, written by an unnamed individual in the city of Yankton, Dakota Territory. That small city is located in the far southeast corner of South Dakota and today is home to a congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Here, this writer mentions receiving several copies of Food for Thinking Christians, a very important booklet prepared in 1881 and receiving wide distribution and preparing to send at least one copy to someone who resided in Minnesota. Who received these booklets, we cannot say. They may have lived in outstate Minnesota rather than the Twin Cities. In 1887, a 32-year-old man who lived in Minneapolis by the name of William E. Page began to subscribe to Zion's Watchtower. In comments he made in 1917, he maintains that he was the first subscriber to this journal in the Twin Cities. Zion's Watchtower publishes a letter he wrote to Brother Russell in 1888. He is clearly grateful for the spiritual awakening that has occurred in his life and indicates that others in his area are also interested, including his wife and mother. Perhaps he was one of those who received the Food for Thinking Christians mentioned in 1883. He must have been very quick to discern that this was the truth because by the end of the year, he is actually contributing articles, which were published in the pages of Zion's Watchtower. From latter comments he made, he apparently traveled to Allegheny, which is now a part of Pittsburgh, in 1890, to visit Brother Russell and to see the new headquarters building called the Bible House. He was still residing in Minneapolis in 1891, but evidently then left permanently to serve at headquarters along with his wife. They became members of the Bible House family and he served as a pilgrim or a traveling representative for the society. He returned in 1906 to give an address to the friends at the convention held in St. Paul that year. He eventually became the vice president of the Watchtower Society for a time before settling down first in Milwaukee and then finally Des Moines. When Russell died, some suggested that he would make a fine president of the Watchtower Society. He graciously declined the notion, deferring to Brother Rutherford. A convention held in Minneapolis in 1919 and another in St. Paul the same year was privileged to have him as a visiting speaker. In 1892, Zion's Watchtower reports that some from Minnesota were in attendance at Allegheny for the memorial. Perhaps it was Brother Page who was so recognized. Or since he was already living at the Bible House, Perhaps it was one of those we will discuss now. However, we do know that when he left Minnesota in 1891, there was apparently no other subscriber to Zion's Watchtower, at least not in Minneapolis or St. Paul.
A family in Diamond Bluff, Wisconsin, which is across the river from Red Wing, named Townsend, was evidently in the truth at this time. Incidentally, in that small river community, there was a very large group of Bible students, which is how the Friends referred to themselves at that time. Some of them moved to the Twin Cities over the years. One well-known family who migrated to St. Paul in 1916 was the Charles Hope family. Many of the older ones among us today can remember them and their four children seen here in a photo from 1968. Anyway, in 1891, one sister in that group, 31-year-old Viola Townsend, moved to St. Paul. Whether she and Brother Page knew one another is uncertain, but for a time she was the only subscriber to the Watchtower in the Twin Cities. In 1892, Mrs. A. W. Peterson, or Minnie, moved to the Twin Cities along with her children. No mention is ever made of where she came from. She was 34 years old and had received the Divine Plan of the Ages, which was the first of the Millennial Dawn series, later called Studies in the Scriptures, published in 1886, and a few copies of Zion's Watchtower from her mother in 1891. Whether her mother was dedicated to the truth and where she lived is not known. It does not appear that her mother moved to the cities with her. When Minnie moved to the Twin Cities in 1892, she wrote to Brother Russell asking about any other Zion's Watchtower subscribers who may live in the area, that she may have a little spiritual association. She was given the name of Sister Townsend, who interestingly had also written in around the same time asking the same thing. Sister Townsend shortly called on her. Thus, the first group was established. Both of these sisters stayed faithful to their death, Sister Townsend in 1924 and Sister Peterson in 1926. Sister Peterson had moved to Zippel Bay on the Lake of the Woods in northern Minnesota in 1910, along with her husband and now grown children, apparently doing so obediently as a wife, but nevertheless being torn from her brothers and sisters here in the Twin Cities. However, Sister Townsend remained in St. Paul her whole life. Sister Peterson's descendants gradually filtered back to the Twin Cities, and some are still in this area, none presently residing in Zippel Bay. Evidently, Brother Russell thought it best, perhaps with some urging from Brother Page, to encourage a brother to move here in order to try and assist this fledgling group. Brother W. Hope Hay, who lived north of Winnipeg, Canada, in a small community called Shoal Lake, was asked to come here. He had inherited a large amount of money from relatives in England, and he used it all to further the kingdom. He donated half to the society, and then Brother Russell suggested that he go into the full-time service, and apparently this was his first assignment. There is no mention of when he first became acquainted with the truth. Apparently married, he arrived in about 1893. He quickly introduced the truth to Martin P. Thorai, an architect who lived at 952 Hague in St. Paul. He was 29 years old and had immigrated to Minneapolis when quite young. The book Lost Twin Cities, a popular local writing that mourns the loss of many wonderful old buildings, mentions him as a master builder. Another architectural work refers to him as Master of the Saw. His home is still standing and has been beautifully restored. He took fast hold on what he was learning. He began writing into headquarters on a regular basis, asking for large quantities of literature, as he was quite effective in placing such. Brother Russell expresses amazement at the large amount of literature he was distributing. His work as an architect took him all over the state, and he used his position to witness. The Watchtower clippings here shown reveal his zeal. According to Sister Peterson, who wrote her story in 1916 in the pages of the St. Paul Enterprise newspaper, up to the spring of 1896, there were only these four who associated together. However, there is evidence that perhaps her memory was off by about a year or two. This is because also writing into Brother Russell in 1894 was a brother C. H. Dickinson, credited with living in Minnesota and probably in the Twin Cities. 
Three times in three years, his letters are published in Zion's Watchtower. His letter of November 1, 1896 shows him to be a deep Bible student and reveals that he and Sister Townsend were acquainted. The photo shown here has 16 brothers and sisters. It appears to be about 1897 or 1898. Almost all of the individuals have been identified. If two identif unidentified ones would be C.H. Dickinson and his wife, then we would be only four or five away from a complete picture. The unfortunate lesson here is to always write on the back of your photos and identify who the people are. The brother at the middle center is Brother J.P. Peterson. He is unrelated to Sister Minnie Peterson. He stayed faithful probably until his death. Unfortunately, the common name prevents us from determining when he would have died. But he was still listed as an elder well into the 1920s. Sister Townsend is at top, second from the left. Brother Thorai is seated in the center with a book on his lap. The sister at the top far right is Sister Reed. She learned the truth from Sister Crawford, who is seated on the photo on the far right. However, no record exists as to who introduced the truth to her. Sister Reed's daughter, Ruth, is at bottom center. She became Ruth Smith. Sister Reed was the matriarch of a large family of staunch servants. Sister Peterson, seated at the bottom left, similarly had many family members who remained faithful. This photo, in fact, came from her grandson, Wayne Peterson of St. Paul, who many of us remember well. Her daughter, Nora, is at bottom right. Both sisters Reed and Peterson still have family members faithfully serving here in the Twin Cities area and elsewhere more than 110 years later. The man seated at left is likely Brother Henry Schlatter from Lawler, Iowa, just south of the Minnesota border, straight down from the Twin Cities. He and his family had been in the truth for a few years, and some of them served as co-porters, or pioneers, assigned to the Twin Cities in the early years. He must have been here on a visit, or in those years the Twin Cities may have had the closest thing to a congregation, and he wanted to be a part of it. His family was full of early anointed ones who remained steadfast well into the 1980s, one daughter living to 105 years of age. An interesting sidebar to this is that in 1896 in Northfield, Minnesota, about 30 miles south of St. Paul, a family named Van Amberg began to read the Watchtower. The family considered themselves a part of the Twin Cities class, as there was none closer. Sister Van Amberg is possibly in the photo second from right on top, but it seems not likely. It could also possibly be Brother Hayes' wife. Sister Van Amberg's son, William, became a member of the Bible House family about 1900 and was one of the eight governing body members who went to Atlanta Penitentiary in 1918 during World War I. He was for many years the treasurer for the Watchtower Society. The family remained in this area until 1909 when they all moved to Brooklyn. The Society had moved from Pittsburgh to New York in that year, so the Van Amberg family moved also in order to be closer to their son who was serving there. Brother Van, as the friends called him, remained very close to families here in this area and for years would return to visit. He served as chairman many times at conventions here over the years. In 1943, when the Society used Minneapolis as the key city, he gave an address to the Friends. An interesting anecdote related to me by Sister Viola Ringrose, who was Ruth Reed's daughter, was that Brother Van Amberg, who as mentioned was for many years the treasurer for the Society, finally purchased the printing rights to the emphatic diaglot right here in the Twin Cities at the Reed home on one of his many visits back here. Recall that this was the translation that awakened Brother Russell and his associates to the invisible presence of Christ. The Society still prints this, and it is available to us today. In the fall of 1898, a Midwest convention was held in Council Bluffs, Iowa, the Watchtower reports that some from Minnesota were in attendance. We can only guess which ones of those mentioned were in attendance. As it was relatively close, likely a few went. We know for sure that some of the Schlatter family were in attendance. They resided in Lawler, Iowa, 
Henry Schlatter being in the photo previously mentioned. Also at least one brother from Diamond Bluff, Wisconsin was there. In the spring of 1900, Brother Charles Dick receives the truth. He was to become a pillar of the congregation here until his death in 1946. He became quite a speaker and even chaired the large convention held in Minneapolis in 1910. His wife was with him in the truth in the early years, but evidently discontinued sometime after Russell's death. She would celebrate holidays even after her husband had discarded them. In 1917, he writes that he was introduced to the truth by a tract entitled, Do You Know? He sent away for, then read and finished, Volume 1 of the Millennial Dawn in one 12-hour period on Good Friday. Some older ones among us at the time of this writing in 2007, Sisters Carvelli of the Mounds Park Congregation and Sister Iverson of the Summit Congregation, both located in St. Paul, were young women in the 1930s and can remember him. In early 1901, W. Hope Hay left the class in the hands of Brother Thorai, who was now firmly grounded. Brother Hay went into the traveling work and served for many years in that capacity until evidently going back up to Manitoba. He served as chairman for the General Convention of the Bible Students held in Niagara Falls, New York in 1905. The last mention of him in the traveling work is in the Zion's Watchtower of February 1906. However, in 1910, the Watchtower informs the readers that Brother Hay had been an invalid for many years and was in a nursing home in Canada. No mention ever made of his death. The May 1901 issue of Zion's Watchtower contains a letter by Brother Thorai which reports that 27 partook of the emblems at the memorial in St. Paul that year. As far back as 1894, the Society had sent out traveling representatives. But starting in 1901, the itinerary began to be published in the Watchtower. So there was probably a traveling overseer that visited prior to this, but the first published visit of a traveling overseer was in the February 1st issue of 1902. Brother George Draper came to visit the Twin Cities class on February 16th through the 21st. In 1903, Zion's Watchtower reports that the Twin Cities had 37 partakers at the memorial on April 5th. As most all in attendance would partake in those years, there were probably no additional individuals present except for perhaps some young children. In 1904, Brother Russell apparently visits the Twin Cities for the first time. A one-day local convention was scheduled at Central Hall in St. Paul with the theme, The Oath-Bound Covenant. Brother Russell now began to visit the Twin Cities on a very regular basis. This was becoming one of the larger classes, and it seems to have been a very fertile area in those years, as we can see from the memorial reports. He no doubt recognized a need to give attention to this field. His schedules were usually published in Zion's Watchtower well ahead of time, so that friends could make their travel plans from outstate and meet with the Twin City class. In February of 1905, the class was dealt a blow when Brother Thorai died. No record of his wife and children ever having associated. He died of tuberculosis at 41 years of age. A brother named Edward Lowe from Minneapolis, whom the papers referred to as Reverend, performed the service. Comments by some who had met Brother Thorai indicate his zeal and love for the truth. One interesting note is that Brother Thorai did much work as an architect in Northfield, Minnesota at St. Olaf College. He worked there for several years on and off. Perhaps it was he who introduced the truth to the Van Amberg family, who, as we remember, lived in Northfield just a short distance from the college. He may have first brought the truth to the Halling family in Lakeville, also not far from Northfield, in the mid to late 1890s. That family produced many staunch Bible students. Many in the Twin Cities knew Floyd and his sister Rose Mickelson. They were grandchildren of Brother Halling. The friends from the cities would often go to Lakeville and have Fifth Sunday conventions at their farm. These were small local conventions that were held every fifth Sunday at various locations. They would take the place of the regularly scheduled meetings that weekend. Brother Thorai may have also introduced the truth to Sister Christensen, 
who was the wife of the world-famous choir director at St. Olaf College, F. Melius Christensen. We can only guess. Brother Thorai's death was no doubt taken hard, but now the class was growing and there were other brothers to step forward and take the lead. The memorial report for 1906 shows that 49 partakers were here in the Twin Cities. So in 10 years, the group grew from 4 to 49. And big news was on the horizon. We can imagine how the local friends reacted when they heard that the society had chosen St. Paul as the location of one of the two general conventions to be held that year. This would bring friends from all over the country and even Europe together here in St. Paul. It was held on August 13th through 19th with daily sessions at the new armory. Much in the way of memorabilia has been preserved. It appears that this photo collage was prepared special for this convention. Notice the photo of Russell in the middle. Around him are 62 brothers and sisters who are apparently the active members of the class. Although the new St. Paul Armory was used for the daily sessions, the public talk was held in the People's Church, neither of which is in existence today. The idea of using a church for our meetings or conventions appears strange to us today, but in those years the friends did not clearly see the need to get out from among them and quit touching the unclean thing. Also, some church groups were more tolerant, and the People's Church was one of those. They, in fact, invited one of the traveling brothers to give the sermon at that church on Sunday morning, whereupon he enthusiastically invited them to the public talk by Brother Russell in the afternoon. The Watchtower reports that about 700 were in attendance on an average daily basis, with about 1,800 for the public talk on the subject to hell and back. Since delegates came from all over, there was good publicity in the newspapers. There were 118 immersed. Included in these was Brother Joseph Franklin Rutherford, according to the book Faith on the March by Brother McMillan. Even though he had known the truth since 1894, he had not attended a convention before and so did not have the opportunity to get baptized. Also baptized was a brother named Andrew Rissell from Nebraska, who later moved to Cambridge, Minnesota. His children migrated to and were very well known in the Twin Cities. There still are many descendants actively serving Jehovah around the Twin Cities today. There were others who were baptized, but records are not available. This event received good publicity in the local press. Not until 1943 would a similar convention be held here, that is, one where the Twin Cities hosted as the key city. The brothers now began to meet in Woodruff Hall at the intersection of Pryor and St. Anthony in St. Paul. As of this year, the friends from both of the Twin Cities still met as one group. The intersection still exists, but the building is long gone. This building served well for them until 1916. Notice the letterhead with this address on it. This letter dated 1912. The memorial report for 1908 shows 103 partakers, and the report for 1910 shows 115, the two cities still meeting as one group. We see here an early invitation to a talk given by Pilgrim Brother George Draper to be held at Woodruff Hall in 1908. In that year, the general convention held closest to the Twin Cities was held at Put-in Bay, Ohio, which was also the site of the Cedar Point Resort where the Watchtower Society held some landmark conventions in later years. Many from this area went. Introduced to the attendees was the Cole Porter Mobile, which we see here being used by sisters Alma Swenson and Carrie Ottison, who became partners in the full-time ministry in 1907. They were assigned out from the Twin Cities into rural areas of greater Minnesota and western Wisconsin. By 1909, there were enough groups scattered around the country that a brother in Chicago began to arrange convention trains that would allow Brother Russell to visit many cities, and quite a few brothers and sisters would travel with him and attend many of these. Some from the Twin Cities were on those tours. The first one of such conventions scheduled for Minnesota was July 5th through the 7th, 1910. There's much in the way of memorabilia and such that has survived. 
The brother who arranged the tour also produced lovely souvenir notes. These were in the form of a book, complete with pictures of the speakers and other scenes. The convention was held in the Minneapolis Auditorium, which the brothers used often for the next several years. It was later renamed the Lyceum Theater, which was the site for the 1938 convention. Notice the photo collage of speakers at this convention. This is the first reference to Brother Henry B. Morrison that I have ever located. He is at this time serving as an elder, so he must be mature. He is not on the collage from 1906, so he must have been baptized in 1906 at the St. Paul Convention or in the next year or two. He became a strong support for the truth in St. Paul until his death in 1947. His son, Robert, was immersed in 1912 and remained faithful till his death in 1985. Brother Reese, shown here, died of TB in 1916. Sadly, at least three of these went apostate in the 1927 division, which we will consider later. This photo was apparently taken surrounding this convention and shows many of the young people associated with the class at this time. Included in this photo are sister Rose Reed and brother Percy Mills, who later married, and both their children were longtime faithful workers. Their daughter, Adeline, married Cliff DuRose, who along with Adeline's brother Frank went to Sandstone Federal Penitentiary during World War II. Cliff pioneered over 40 years before his death, while Frank moved to Arkansas. In early 1911, Brother Russell again came and gave a widely publicized talk at the auditorium. Again in 1912 he came, and a series of talks given by him and other traveling brothers was given at the Schubert Theater in Minneapolis. In fact, on a regular basis, traveling brothers were visiting the class, and these events were like small assemblies. They were often heavily advertised and undoubtedly contributed to the growth of the class. The class was really growing now, as the memorial report mentioned earlier shows 115 partakers in 1910, 160 in 1913, 206 in 1914, and by 1915 there were 266. This was the 10th largest figure in the world for any one location, according to the Watchtower of April 15, 1915. By the way, with the move to New York, the word Zions was dropped from the title. So from this time forward, the magazine will always be referred to as The Watchtower. This would explain the frequent visits by Pastor Russell, as this was a larger group and was growing steadily. The brothers were very active in reaching other, more remote parts of the state by sending speakers out to give talks. Also, many would move away and help in forming groups in other parts of the state or the country. In 1913, there begins a chapter in this story that is unique to the Twin Cities and was to have far-reaching effects on the entire Brotherhood. In 1910, a newspaper man named William Abbott began to publish a paper for the east side of St. Paul. It was named the St. Paul Enterprise. It was much like other papers in town. It was printed in the Globe building in downtown St. Paul, the Globe also being a newspaper. About this time, the Watchtower started to syndicate Brother Russell's sermons in newspapers across the country. This became the largest syndicate of the time, reaching a peak of 2,000 papers. In the Twin Cities, the other papers never agreed to carry them. During a presidential campaign in 1912, Mr. Abbott accidentally printed one of Pastor Russell's sermons, thinking it was just another political message. The local brothers saw this and immediately sent Brother Dick to inquire if they could not have him regularly print Pastor Russell's sermons. Well, he agreed to do so on the condition that Brother Dick could get him 100 more subscribers. Brother Dick delivered not just 100, but several hundred. When the local citizens began to protest having to read this stuff, he explained that he had made a contract and would stick to it. He did agree to print other clergy sermons, however, as a sort of compromise. What began was a debate between readers who would write in and support one side or the other 
in the letters to the editor section. The truth prevailed to the extent that Mr. Abbott himself was convinced and came into the truth and was baptized. Also, the brothers soon began to send copies of this paper to distant brothers in outlying areas and even other states. Subscriptions began pouring in, and soon the paper, which was now managed and owned by a brother, began to include almost exclusively news pertaining to Bible students. Secular events were always reported on from the viewpoint of the Bible students, recognizing the significance of 1914. Local readership among the general population dwindled, but the circulation boomed as the paper became a virtual newsletter for those associated with the society. It always had, however, a strong, dominant Twin Cities flavor. Weekly reports were made of the local work and matters relating to the class. New brothers and sisters were welcomed in its pages. Notice this item, which records the results of the election of elders and deacons from the previous meeting. But the friends from all over would write in and share experiences in their hometowns. Notices would be published regarding upcoming conventions and reports of the most recent pilgrim visit or circuit overseer's visit. They would often place advertisements for goods and services and also search for partners in the coal porter work. They would write reports about recent conventions and place death notices of well-known brothers or sisters. Almost everyone in the truth in the later teen years and early 1920s was a subscriber. The publishing company also became the vehicle for which a number of publications were produced and distributed. At that time, the brothers would often write booklets independent of the society, and these would receive wide distribution. The practice was not discouraged, and many of them are viewed almost on a par with official Watchtower publications, some of them even being listed in the Watchtower Society's indexes. Also, lots of trinkets were available to the readers, things like scripture postcards, photos of various events and prominent brothers, cross and crown pins, etc. One brother who was quite prolific as a writer was W. H. Bradford. He had known the truth since 1898 and been, had been a part of the Twin City class off and on and then permanently since about 1910. He contributed many articles to the Enterprise and also wrote two widely distributed booklets, An Answer to Dr. Gray and The Rich Young Man, which is a memorial address of Brother Russell's death. He also spoke at many conventions and was rather prominent. He was falsely accused of embezzlement at his place of employment in 1917, and although the charges were dropped, he evidently was so humiliated that he moved to Alabama that year. He contributed a few more items to the Enterprise, but after 1919 is not heard from again. Considering his very prominent role, this is rather puzzling. Perhaps he died. Or perhaps he may have gone with the opposition when the apostasy started in those years after Russell died. This happened to so many prominent ones that, although not a pleasant thought, it is rather realistic. Brother Abbott and his wife became celebrities of sorts, as they would often travel to other conventions and be greeted by subscribers. They would then publish their notes of that convention in the paper. The closest convention to the Twin Cities in 1914 was in Clinton, Iowa, a river town near Dubuque. In this photo of the Twin Cities friends at this convention, we can see him sitting on the far left. Brother Abbott died in 1917, rather young, and his wife continued afterward with the assistance of family members and others from the local congregation. She moved to California in the mid-1920s. We will discuss what happened to the paper shortly. In January 1916, this item appeared in the Enterprise. Twin Cities Class, No More. This was a noteworthy event. Now the Twin Cities Class became two. The memorial report for 1917 shows 157 partakers in Minneapolis and 91 in St. Paul. The St. Paul friends met here in the IOOF Hall, or the International Order of Oddfellows Hall, and continued there well into the 1940s. 
The Minneapolis friends first met at a hall on Lake and Nicollet, but shortly moved to this location on 3rd Street. They met in Yeoman Hall on the third floor of the DeSoto building until 1927. There are a few older brothers and sisters still active today in 2007 that can recall meeting at both of these locations as young adults or children. If we now return to early 1914, we can relive one of the most significant events in Jehovah's modern day organization. This was the showing of the photo drama of creation. Premiering in New York, it began to circulate across the country. In 1914 and 1915, often the photodrama was shown in the evening at large conventions like the one in Clinton, Iowa. It reached the Twin Cities on April 26, 1914 and showed for a month at the old St. Paul Auditorium. In 1915, these reports appeared in the Enterprise. The photodrama consisted of colored slides and film synchronized with records. It was kept under the control of the society and they did the scheduling and provided the crew of four brothers to operate it. The local brothers would do the advertising and provide ushers and so forth. Since it contained film, it could only be shown in movie theaters. That limited the showing to larger communities that had the modern equipment that could be utilized. There was in those years no such thing as a portable film projector. The Twin Cities was the only place where the society experimented with paid admissions. This was to determine if more would attend when there was some monetary value placed on the show. This trial method was not implemented at all showings in the Twin Cities, but it did seem to boost attendance whenever it was. However, the concept is not in harmony with the whole position taken on collections and voluntary donations, so it was dropped. By the time Russell died in 1916, the work of the photodrama was over in the United States. Also, as technology improved, it soon became antiquated, and as is true of motion pictures today, the general population would probably attend only once. However, the local friends had the option of purchasing a somewhat scaled-down version of the photodrama called the Eureka Drama. This consisted of tinted rather than colored slides and had no film. It could therefore be shown in outlying areas that had no movie houses or even no electricity, as a slide projector could be operated with an acetylene attachment or powered off a car battery. The Twin Cities class went ahead and purchased this. It was shown for many more years than the photodrama. It came under the direction of Brother August Swenson along with his wife, Ina. They traveled to many smaller towns, which now would be considered suburbs. They could show in towns, town halls, or community centers. They would frequently write back to the friends in the Twin Cities and report their successes. These reports would often appear in the Enterprise. As of this writing, I know of no one still alive in the Twin Cities who saw the original photodrama in its complete form. There were two fleshly sisters whom I knew, Evelyn and Vernie Hope, later Evelyn Carlson and Vernie Olson, who worked as usherettes for the showing of the photodrama. But they've been gone for about 20 years, having moved to Phoenix in their golden years where they died faithful. There are many, however, who have seen the Eureka drama, which has survived and was shown off and on locally for many years to come, more as a curiosity than a scheduled meeting. Since the Eureka drama was purchased by the local brothers, it did not return to Brooklyn as did the photo drama. It eventually found its way into the hands of Brother Earl Seliger, where it resides to this day. The photo here now shows a group of local friends in September of 1916, if you look closely at the calendar on the wall, getting the Bible students monthly ready for distributing in front of area churches the following morning. This was just a few weeks before Brother Russell died on October 31, 1916. This dealt quite a blow to the organization as a whole, but it did not seem to affect the local brothers too much at this time. Although within about a year an apostasy developed at head headquarters, little evidence of any deviation is seen here in either Twin Cities class. However, the local brothers slowed down, just as the whole organization did. 
The war was raging in Europe, and when the United States entered the war, the issue of neutrality surfaced. Under these circumstances, the local friends held a convention at the old West Hotel in Minneapolis. Brother Rutherford was here as well as a number of other traveling brothers. Twenty-seven were immersed, so the work was still progressing. But this would be the last time any here would see Brother Rutherford for two years. The memorial report for 1917 reveals 157 partakers in Minneapolis and 91 in St. Paul. Even as eight members of headquarters were arrested and sentenced to prison at Atlanta, so too were some of the local brothers. The government banned the seventh volume of the Studies in the Scriptures, titled The Finished Mystery. They also forbid the Bible Students' Monthly Tract. When that happened, the brothers came out with a new tract called Kingdom News to replace it. But the government banned that one too. All these items were very harsh in their criticism of the various churches and their complicity with the governments in wartime. The local supply of banned literature was surrendered to the government. Also, several local brothers were drafted and sentenced to prison or alternative service when they refused to take up arms. The photos here show a group of four brothers imprisoned at Fort Dodge, Iowa. Two of these, Brother Rudy Olson, seated, and Albert Lawrence, standing directly behind him, were from St. Paul. Others were sent elsewhere. This photo shows a number of brothers at Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary in Kansas. The fourth one from the right is Ernest Hillman, whose family received the truth in 1915 in the Chisago City area. This photo was sent to his sister. The Hillman family produced many faithful anointed ones. Not shown in the photo, but also at Leavenworth, is a brother named Harold Bruber, who was from St. Paul, although he had just moved to northern Minnesota on Zippo Bay when this transpired. The issue of neutrality was not so clear then, and some compromises were made, but they tried to stay out of the war as best they could. You'll recall that Brother Abbott of the Enterprise died in 1917. For about a year, his wife, May, continued with the help of her brother, Albert Lawrence, and a few others. This photo shows Sister Lovitz, Brother Kelly, the typo machine operator, and Sister Vernie Olson, or Vernie Hope. In 1918, she called on a brother well-known to the friends who was experienced as a journalist. His name was C.E. Stewart. He lived in Springfield, Illinois, and had been in the truth since 1901. He had been Pastor Russell's press agent on the transcontinental tour of 1913 and was a prominent speaker. He invested in the paper and moved his family here to become the editor. He was quite a deep spiritual man, and the paper became more spiritual as well. He changed the name to The New Era Enterprise. During the war, he would print Watchtower articles in the paper so that subscribers could get the spiritual food in areas of the world where the Watchtower was banned, such as Canada and any other segment of the British Crown. He was fiercely loyal to Jehovah's organization, and as the apostasy was raging in those first years of his editorship, it is interesting to read how he always directed readers back to the Watchtower. Prominent brothers who deviated would try to air their views to the friends by circulating various tracts and going on speaking tours. Brother Stewart would use his position with the Enterprise to present the proper view and urge the readers to stay loyal to the channel that brought them the truth in the first place. This letter bears the new title of that newspaper that he decided upon after his tenure began. As the letter reads, because of his journalistic experience, in 1922, Brother Rutherford invited him to Bethel to become an associate editor of the Golden Age magazine. He accepted, and so he and his wife and son became members of the Bethel family. Eventually, he became co-editor of the Watchtower itself. His wife, however, did not adapt well to institutional life, and so they returned to St. Paul in early 1926. Brother Stewart died in 1949. He left a gift for the congregation when he died, his personal collection of the Golden Age, complete to the very first issue. Also, the original Watchtower magazines back to 1895. No other Kingdom Hall in the area can boast of such a fine collection. 
As the accompanying letter shows, another brother took over the paper. It seems that the new brother did not have the same loyalty to Jehovah's organization and would water down some of Judge Rutherford's talks when reporting, so the judge denounced the paper in the pages of the Golden Age in 1925. It died a lingering death and went out of business in early 1928. For several years, however, it was a fascinating period in the history of the Twin Cities and the organization as a whole. Without it, little would be known of many early events. In 1971, when the Society started to prepare the 1975 yearbook, which was a mini proclaimers book without pictures, they contacted many of the old timers for their input, and one of these was Ned Stewart, C.E. Stewart's son, who was at this time living in Billings, Montana. He sent the complete file of the Enterprise from 1918 to 1922, which his father had been involved with and had left to him, and they are in New York to this day. It is not uncommon to turn up miscellaneous issues. I have about 50. But for this project, I had to turn to the Minnesota Historical Society. They have the entire run from 1910 to 1928 on microfilm. By spring of 1919, the brothers in Atlanta had been released. A large nationwide petition work was done prior to this, but it did not figure into their release. The friends were trying to get them pardoned, to receive a new trial, or at least to be admitted to bail pending an appeal. But Jehovah chose to have them completely exonerated instead. The local brothers did their share in writing to various government officials to try to get the case heard. A similar effort has been made in more recent times when persecution arose in any given section of the earth. Some of the letters received were favorable and others reflected the hatred for the brothers. This case was very much a newsworthy thing and so it created much publicity for the truth. Even before the landmark convention at Cedar Point, Ohio, several of these brothers came to St. Paul for a convention in June 18 through 22, 1919. The daily meetings were held at the old Ryan Hotel, but the public talk was at the Metropolitan Opera House. This was a larger convention, attracting brothers from all around the Midwest. This was the first opportunity for most to hear the experiences of these brothers since they had gone to trial. Brother Van Amberg was able to attend, and undoubtedly the friends were overjoyed to see him again. Just a few months later, the friends from all over attended the most important convention held up to that time at Cedar Point, Ohio. Many from the Twin Cities attended. As the Morrison family shown here, all were thrilled to receive the new magazine, The Golden Age. The memorial report for 1919 shows 221 partakers in Minneapolis and 90 in St. Paul. In 1920, only 132 partook in Minneapolis. Some evidently quit or slowed down considerably. As we know, the prophecy says that the two witnesses would lie dead or inactive in the streets. In 1919, they were restored to life spiritually. And so by 1921, it was back up to 143 and in 1922 at 197, with 98 in St. Paul. Some no doubt becoming active again and other new ones being added. In July of 1920, Judge Rutherford came to Minneapolis to attend a convention where he delivered the famous lecture, Millions Now Living Will Never Die. This theme was included for a few years in many of the talks given by the Traveling Brothers, as this flyer from later in the year illustrates. The whole organization was growing again and with renewed zeal. This photo shows a group of friends from the Twin Cities in service in Albert Lee, Minnesota. From 1922, through 1928, the Society had seven large conventions. By 1930, with the publication of the book Light, these were understood to be prophetic in nature, all being associated with special proclamations which were made and distributed by the millions. None of these were held in Minnesota. But many of the local friends traveled to these, and some photos are shown here of groups of the local friends. Often they would hire an entire Pullman car or a train car and go as a group. Many of the local friends were in attendance in Columbus in 1931 when the name Jehovah's Witnesses was adopted. The local brothers would also organize smaller conventions of their own, some samples of the programs for these being shown here. Also, they would schedule public talks in outlying areas. Eventually, congregations would be formed, 
but initially interested ones were loosely tied into the Twin Cities classes, and of course to the society by means of the Watchtower. The congregations in both cities continued to grow. The memorial report in 1924 shows 220 partakers in Minneapolis and 94 in St. Paul. 1926 reports show 233 in Minneapolis and 100 in St. Paul, with a separate class in Polish of 36. 1927 was the final year that memorial reports were published in the Watchtower. Thereafter, the Society published all the year reports by branch, not by city, in the pages of the yearbook, which also first was published in 1927. There were 226 partakers in Minneapolis and 106 in St. Paul. In 1927, the apostasy that had affected the rest of the organization some years ago after Russell had died now finally reached the Twin Cities. That year, a division occurred in the Minneapolis class. Much larger and with many older prominent brothers, about one half of the class shrank back. A few older ones alive at the time of this writing in 2007 can still remember this event. As a young boy, Earl Seliger was there. Brother Salverson in the St. Louis Park congregation, whose father would tell him about it. Brother Seliger recalled how he and his mother were at the meeting when the argument broke out. The brother conducting asked all loyal to the Watchtower Society to sit on one side and all the others to sit on the other side. Earl explained how he did not quite understand what was happening and began to stand up and move when his mother firmly forced him back into his seat and told him to stay right where you are, as they happened to already be sitting on the loyal side. He can still remember one of the leaders of the opposition shaking his fist at them as the group left the building. Sadly, the brother moderating also eventually left Jehovah's organization and took sides with the opposition. Curiously, for some unexplained reason, the St. Paul group appears to have been unaffected by this, at least not noticeably. However, both Polish groups left Jehovah's organization at this time. Those who remained faithful were assimilated into the English-speaking class. Among these was the Grabowski family of Minneapolis. The issue is not so clear now as to what specific finally triggered it, but it was likely an accumulation of things. By 1927, the holidays had been discarded. Preaching was increasingly emphasized, and Judge Rutherford was not the same as Pastor Russell. He also did not like creature worship and tried to stamp it out. Those who wanted to be followers of Russell, rather than Jesus, became disgruntled. It seems that it is no coincidence that the Enterprise died at this time. With some of the readership now in opposition to the society, and the organization tightening up, being drawn into closer ties with headquarters, the focus was now entirely on the preaching work. The Enterprise was somewhat driven by interest in the affairs and statements of prominent brothers and sisters. So as the organization matured, this was gradually filtered out as it should have been. The existence of such an operation would not be welcomed or permitted today, as things are much clearer as to the channel from which our spiritual food comes from. But we are gr grateful for the glimpse into the past that we gain from the pages of that paper. Just prior to the split in Minneapolis, a change of venue took place. The brothers began to meet in the Gustavus Adolphus Hall at 1628 Lake Street, still standing but now a burned out shell. The St. Paul friends continued to meet at the Oddfellows Hall for many more years. The opposition met for a while together, but they soon began to splinter into smaller groups until today there is none left. You can see from this directory of the Associated Bible Students in 1935 that they still used the cross and crown insignia in their worship, while the brothers had discarded it four years previously. It is sad to see that some who had been on the ground floor of the local group had retraced their steps and abandoned true worship. They continued to have local conventions, but soon there was no one to attend. They were loosely tied together nationally by means of various magazines, most all of which have been discontinued. Throughout the decade of the 1980s, I personally met a handful that were still alive. 
Sometimes I would run across them in the ministry. Others I would search out regarding this project, but they're all gone. The old original opposers died. Some of their children may have continued for a while, but now they're gone too. Also, the original groups would continue to divide as personality or doctrinal differences surfaced. Since the opposers did no evangelizing, the groups simply faded out as individuals died. It is interesting to compare the local Minneapolis directory of the Friends from 1927 with the one from 1929, and you can see how many had left. Many of them were the prominent ones, some having been among the very earliest ones. Pride is before a crash. During the 1920s, some very well-known brothers became associated who were to really play a role in the growth of the organization. Among these were brothers Flynn, Vidim, Clunder, Kutek, Sandine, Freihofer, Salverson. Territories were created, and preaching became more organized. Phonograph witnessing began in the early 1930s, and the two congregations purchased a sound car and outfitted it for the transcription work. This was used well into the 1940s. Local conventions in the 1920s were often organized by the local brothers who would invite a member of headquarters or a traveling brother to speak. Soon the reverse was true. Local conventions were organized by the society who would invite the brothers to attend. Radio witnessing also became important towards the end of the 1920s, just as newspaper witnessing was used in the days of Russell. The society is always on the cutting edge of current technology. The society actually constructed their own station in New York and Chicago. But in most parts of the country, and the world for that matter, they simply contracted with local stations to broadcast Judge Rutherford's lectures, which were recorded. Or they would tie in with a network of stations in order to broadcast a particular lecture given at a convention. The first station in the Twin Cities to air Judge Rutherford's lectures was WRHM. This began about January 1, 1927. The June 1st Watchtower is the first one to list a Twin Cities station among those that carried the judge's lectures. The directories of the classes that are displayed here are the first that include assignments of servants dedicated to radio witnessing in those days. People who listened would write into the station and request literature that they heard advertised on a Watchtower broadcast. Then the society would send out follow-up slips just as they do today. These photos from the mid-1930s show a large group of St. Paul friends meeting at Brother Rudy Olson's home, which is on the intersection of Minnehaha and McKnight Road on the east side. Anyone who is familiar with the area would be astounded at the growth of the city as you look at these pictures looking toward the west. Anyhow, they're all listening to Judge Rutherford on the radio. Other times they would meet at the Oddfellows or other rented hall to hear one of Rutherford's network lectures. Sometimes the brothers would prepare local programs that would be of interest to the general population. One such local one was Aunt Ruth's Bible Stories, broadcast on WCCO around 1930. It ran for about two years. It appears that here in the Twin Cities, only a couple of radio stations were used for any length of time. In 1934, the brothers contracted with WDGY for about a three-year run. Later on, however, sometimes a single broadcast would be arranged over another. The local brothers would make contracts with the radio station to broadcast weekly the recordings of the judge. One story related to me by sister Catherine Iverson was an incident around 1937 when the radio station WDGY received a bomb threat after airing a lecture titled Fathers by Rutherford. The lecture referred to the Pope as Papa, which angered local Catholics. It made headlines the next morning in the St. Paul Daily News paper. Subsequently, the station bowed to pressure and refused to watch tower programs. After this, no radio station in the Twin Cities was willing to carry regular programs. This was true everywhere, however, as the Catholic Church was putting enormous pressure on radio stations to discontinue. Starting in 1936, the brothers from Minneapolis began to publish their own monthly service instructions. Similar to the Kingdom Ministry, it contained announcements regarding meetings for service, assignments for sound car work, campaign information, and references to letters and instructions from headquarters. 
At first it was entitled, The Minneapolis Witness. It appears that after a few issues it was changed to The Harkener. Possibly this is because at that time the two groups decided to publish a joint paper. In either case, they're interesting to look at now as they give us a glimpse as to the organization of the congregations 70 years ago. One interesting item is this one from the Memorial Report of 1938. There were 181 anointed partakers and 129 Jonadabs, or members of the great crowd. These figures were combined from both groups. Some of those listed as having responsibilities in 1937 are still serving faithfully today. Also, the service report for the 1937 and 1938 service year shows a high of 326 publishers in April and a low of 183 in December. They distributed 97,423 booklets and 7,090 books. Initially, the idea of having localized written instructions like this sounded good. In fact, many classes in many cities across the country did a similar thing. Certainly the motives were good. But as the Proclaimer's book on page 640 shows, this practice was initially tolerated, but then discontinued. It was actually a step backwards, into the days of the St. Paul Enterprise. The faithful and discreet slave class is responsible for our instruction and spiritual feeding program. The local friends would travel to the large general conventions in other parts of the country. This photo shows a bus hired to transport brothers to the convention in Columbus, Ohio that year. With the clouds of World War II forming, opposition increased. In 1938, the brothers scheduled an assembly on West 7th Street, which was canceled due to pressure from local clergy. In 1939, the small town of Hastings, south of St. Paul, threw the brothers out when they were preaching. In Sartell, near St. Cloud, the brothers had an assembly, but were mobbed afterwards. The brothers entrenched themselves. In 1938, Minneapolis was tied into London for the public talk given at the General Convention that year. Much publicity was given to the public talk, Face the Facts. This was a heavily publicized event, which was held at the old Minneapolis Auditorium, renamed the Lyceum Theater. The accompanying photos show various scenes around town, including information marches in downtown Minneapolis. We see Brother Fred Greeno leading the way. He had been a staunch servant since around the turn of the century, having moved here in the 1900s. His daughter, Grace, married Walter Keenitz from Rockford, Minnesota, and then went to Newfoundland as missionaries. Many of the older friends seem to have been baptized around these years of 1938 to 1940. This has been commented on in various publications as a result of the restoration of theocratic order in the congregations in the year 1938. The appointment of overseers was now entirely done theocratically instead of democratically. The great crowd was growing, and soon the two congregations would be forced to divide and form new congregations. Some outlying areas where there were only one or two families associated were joined by some from the cities who were more experienced. Congregations could then be formed. In 1940, the local friends were tied into the convention at Detroit. They had difficulty renting a facility as the local venue managers would cancel their agreement to rent to the brothers after the local clergy brought pressure upon them. Even the state fair management bowed to pressure and canceled use of a portion of the facilities. Eventually, a location in downtown St. Paul was found, and the convention went on as planned. In these photos, we see Brother John Booth holding a sign along with an unnamed sister, probably in downtown St. Paul. In the other two photos, we see Brother Morrison, the Sandines, and the Flynns, as well as Sister Greeno holding up their signs for a photo shot. 1,850 attendees packed out the two main halls, as well as the two dining rooms, as well as several hundred outside around the sound car for the public talk, Religion as a World Remedy. Also introduced to the audience was the new vertical phonograph, which could play upright while closed. The immersion was held at Lake Phelan, the youngest being eight years old, the oldest 80. Among these were sisters Rosamond Alberg and Alice Lund, who along with her husband went to Gilead and then assigned to Puerto Rico in 1949.
1941, the Watchtower Society organized a convention in St. Louis, Missouri. Many local friends traveled to that convention. This was the last time that Brother Rutherford would speak at a large gathering, as he would die about six months later. At the release of the children book, all the young ones filed up to get a copy from Brother Rutherford. Among them were many still faithfully serving today who were in attendance with their families. Also, many of the older friends took the opportunity to get baptized. Among them were the three Humphrey brothers from St. Paul, Charlie, Louis, and Jean, who also went to prison together shortly afterwards. At the start of World War II, the issue of neutrality was crystal clear, unlike 20 years previously when the brothers were uncertain what to do. The U.S. went to war in 1941 and our brothers here began to go to prison. Eventually, hundreds ended up in Sandstone Federal Penitentiary, many from the Twin Cities. A few of these are still with us and faithful to this day. Many of these had anointed parents who had raised them in the truth, like Louis Frankus of Minneapolis. Some had only been in the truth a short time, such as Brother Dan Jewell, who was 16 years old when he was baptized in 1940 and soon wound up in prison two years later. Others, like Charlie Humphrey, were 38 years old, with a wife and two children to support. Though our brothers here were not savagely persecuted as our brothers in Germany, still, what a massive collective reply to Satan. The society quickly organized visits by brothers like A. H. McMillan, who himself had been imprisoned in 1918. Brother Earl Seliger related how he had the privilege of driving Brother McMillan from the cities to Sandstone. What a privilege to spend that kind of time with such a spiritual man. Many of these brothers, like Neil Kelly, related that those years in Sandstone were what made them solid in the faith as a result of the time devoted to study. As they were released, many continued in the pioneer work and did so to their death, like Cliff DuRose. Others, with families to care for, often had a hard time finding employment. Remember, they were ex-convicts, and returning war veterans were by law given the first choice of jobs. Jehovah always provides, however, and a blessing to the friends here was a brother named Art Brenner, who had a responsible position with the railroad. He was able to hire a number of the brothers at the Union Depot in St. Paul. He was also the one who donated the land for the Kingdom Hall on Maryland Avenue, in St. Paul. During the ensuing years of the Korean and the Vietnam War, our brothers continued to face the draft board and many local brothers spent time in various prisons until the federal government abolished the draft. In 1942, the local brothers were tied into the convention in Cleveland, Ohio for the very important public talk, Peace Can It Last. 3,500 attended and 127 individuals were immersed in Lake Calhoun. Among these was Sister Cummings of the Northeast Congregation in Minneapolis. In 1943, the Society designated Minneapolis as the key city for all the conventions that year, the first time since 1906. All other cities were tied in by wire and heard Brother Knorr speak on the theme, Freedom in the New World. There were 17,000 who attended at the old Minneapolis Auditorium, and 237 were baptized in Lake Calhoun. This was quite an increase over the last general convention held in the Twin Cities in 1906, when only 1,800 were present and represented about half of the friends in the U.S. Of course, not all the 17,000 were local friends, as many traveled from all over the Midwest. At this convention, old brother Van Amberg spoke. He died on February 7, 1947, having served as treasurer since 1903. There would have been, in the audience, a handful that would have remembered him from his days in the Twin Cities almost half a century ago. One rather comical event that transpired during this convention surrounded the effort of several brothers and sisters from Canada to attend. Many were arrested as they crossed the border prior to the start of the convention. Since the work was under ban there due to the war, this was done illegally. Some, however, were successful in making it to Minneapolis. They saw this as, we must obey God as ruler rather than men. The local authorities got wind and maintained a presence at the convention in order to apprehend any they found. The local brothers managed to keep it all safely covered up, 
until the attempt was made to transport them back up to the border after the convention. When the brother driving the truck got close to the border, he could see the authorities waiting for them, and he pulled over. All the brothers and sisters hopped out and ran, and the authorities followed them, not the truck, and arrested them. The brother driving turned around and came back to the cities, and though he was questioned, he was never arrested, though he did wind up in sandstone later on anyhow for the draft. The early 1940s began to see the two congregations begin to divide. The brothers did not own their buildings at the time, so they would rent available upper rooms and storefronts. They also moved around a lot. It's hard to trace the exact sequence of division as the memories of the older friends often are not as good as they once were. But it seems that growth was likely along the following lines. Until about 1940, the St. Paul friends met at Oddfellows Hall on 9th Street. These photos showing Brother Bob Morrison standing at the back of the hall in April of 1940 are the only ones I've ever seen of the interior of Oddfellows Hall. For an unknown reason, they then moved to 345 and 1 half Robert Street. They, however, continued to use Oddfellows Hall for several years for larger events such as circuit assemblies. By 1945, the congregation divided and formed a South Unit and an East Unit, the original now being called the West Unit, a total of three congregations. The East Unit met at 355 Jackson Street on the main floor, but soon took a second floor room as it was better suited for their use. This had the address of 353 Jackson. By 1948, the South Unit was meeting at 405 South Wabasha Street. Soon they were in a building at 239 Concord Street. This was a real milestone, as it was the first building owned by the brothers in the Twin Cities, built solely for use as a Kingdom Hall. Later, in 1964, they built the Kingdom Hall on Christensen Avenue, which still serves well for the three congregations that meet there. This was under the direction of Brother August Vogel, who was for many years a pillar in St. Paul. He had come from Duluth after having served as a traveling overseer for many years. He was instrumental in helping to build several Kingdom Halls in the St. Paul area, and he also served as the St. Paul City Overseer up until the time he moved to Arizona with his wife, Inez. In time, the South Unit divided several times and formed Hastings, Newport, Riverview, Egan, Invergrove Heights. What became the West Unit went from Robert Street to Jackson Street, to 426 Wabasha Street, to a room on St. Peter Street, they then moved to 496 Selby, and in 1949, they bought the property at 678 Hague Avenue, which is still the home to several congregations, having received a thorough remodeling. They also divided several times, forming Como, Wheelock, Summit, and Fort Road, although, as in most cases, more than one congregation was involved in a division. The East Unit was formed around 1945 and moved from Jackson Street to a rented room off East 7th Street, before purchasing an old bank building on Mariah Street in the Dayton's Bluff area by about 1950. They stayed there till 1969 when they built the Kingdom Hall on Century Avenue in Maplewood. In 1974, they divided and formed Maplewood and Woodbury. Then around 1990, they divided again and formed Oakdale and Mounds Park. In 1948, a congregation was formed in White Bear Lake, just north of town, the first suburban congregation. Anyhow, by 1947, there were just these three congregations in St. Paul. Soon thereafter, however, a central congregation was formed in 1955, which became the North St. Paul Congregation, later named Phelan Park. They met in an old building at Case and Arkwright from 1960 through 1962, and in 1963, they built the Kingdom Hall on Maryland Avenue, which is still in use today. In 1975, they divided again and formed Edgerton. In Minneapolis, after leaving the DeSoto building in 1927, the friends met at Gustavus Adolphus Hall at 1628 East Lake Street. This was until some time in the early to mid-1930s. They then moved to 406 East Hennepin. They remained there until about 1940 when they moved to 745 East 14th Street. From there, they divided into the West and South Unit. The West met at 1112 East Lake Street and the West met at 2 East Lake Street on the corner where a Kmart is sitting now. 
They soon divided again and formed the North Unit at 722 26th Avenue North and the East Unit at 415 Central Avenue. In 1949, the West and South jointly built the hall on 37th Street and Chicago. This dual hall served for about a half century before recently being sold due to neighborhood deterioration. This was property owned and donated by Brother Soderlund, who had been baptized in 1911 and owned the plumbing business next door. This was the second building in the Twin Cities owned by the brothers. So by 1947, there were now seven congregations in the Twin Cities, three in St. Paul and four in Minneapolis. The great crowd were joining themselves to the anointed at a fast pace, from two congregations in 1940 to seven in 1947. In 1948, a separate congregation was also formed in Hopkins at 9th and Excelsior, which would have been the first congregation in an immediate suburb of Minneapolis. This eventually grew into the St. Louis Park and Minnetonka congregations located on Highway 7. By about 1950, the East Unit had built the Kingdom Hall on 26th and Central in Northeast Minneapolis, and the North Unit had built the hall on Fremont Avenue. The Northeast Unit was the seed for several divisions in the next few years. New Brighton was formed in about 1950 and built a hall on Old Highway 8 in 1958. Columbia Heights was formed in the early 1970s. Both halls served well for many years until the East Unit, now Northeast, sold and built on Silver Lake Road in New Brighton. After a fire destroyed the hall on Fremont, the brothers built on Brookdale Drive in Brooklyn Center, now the home of three congregations, North, Dowling, and Brookdale. In 1955, a congregation was formed in the Riverside area, and by 1959 they had their own Kingdom Hall. By 1958, a congregation was formed and an unusually modern building was erected in Golden Valley on Duluth Street. Glenwood was formed in 1961, and now there are three congregations meeting in the building which was completed in 1983 off of Highway 55. In the early 1940s, there was as yet no such thing as circuit assembly or circuit overseers. There was what was referred to at that time as zone assemblies, which did not take place on as regular a basis. Another larger one was the Call to Action Assembly, which took place in April of 1943. It was held at Eagles Hall on Southeast 4th Street in Minneapolis. This assembly was held in connection with a special literature campaign and concluding with the memorial at all the local kingdom halls. They were held in 300 cities across the United States on the same three days. The baptisms for these localized conventions were often held at the farm of brother and sister Getsky in Egan, who had come into the truth in 1940. They were associated with the St. Paul congregation and eventually were with the South Unit. Sister Violet Jackson of the Riverview congregation in St. Paul is their daughter, and she provided these photos. Many today in the truth can remember being baptized in the baptismal tank at their farm, including my mother in 1942. In 1947, the circuit arrangement started. At first, all the congregations in the Twin Cities were in one circuit, but soon a separation took place and outlying congregations were brought in to create a mix of rural and urban congregations. Often the assemblies were held in one of the smaller towns in the circuit so as to draw the public's attention to the kingdom. Field service was a part of each assembly, so you can imagine how a thousand brothers would stir things up in a small town of only a few thousand. Some of the first circuit overseers were anointed brothers who went on to become members of the governing body or branch overseers. Another development in Jehovah's Organization was the establishing of Gilead School in 1943. Many from the Twin Cities went to some of these earlier classes and served in many different parts of the world. One brother shown here, Keith Glessing, who went to Gilead in 1952, had to first overcome a prejudiced draft board here in the Twin Cities. His case was appealed and was covered by the Society in the Awake magazine in July of 1952. Over the years, up until the present, there have been many who have attended. Some, but definitely not all, are shown here. Often, this was a good opportunity for the local brothers to obtain publicity. Some returned after many years and resumed service in local congregations, many still with us today. Throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, 
The society would have either one or just a few large conventions each summer around the country. Many of our local brothers can remember traveling to New York to be a part of those huge throngs at Yankee Stadium. Besides circuit assemblies, the Twin Cities was not used very often as a location for a district convention. After 1943, the next time the society had a larger assembly here was 1951 at the Minneapolis Armory, Brother Henschel delivering the public address. Most years, the local brothers went to a variety of cities, Duluth in 1952, Rochester, La Crosse, St. Cloud, Sioux Falls, Milwaukee, etc. Often the brothers would use the opportunity to obtain newspaper publicity as many delegates would travel to these conventions. This very favorable article appeared in the Minneapolis paper surrounding the 1958 convention. In 1965, the society organized a convention at the old Metropolitan Stadium in Bloomington, which at that time was only a few years old. They also used this venue again in 1970. Beginning in 1974, however, and lasting for about 10 years, the brothers began using the new St. Paul Civic Center for the district conventions. Many of us in the Twin Cities have fond memories of going there and serving in various capacities. These conventions initially still required us to engage in rooming work, something that we used to do for large conventions in order to accommodate all the visiting delegates. But that work is a thing of the past. One of the more notable of these was the 1983 Kingdom Unity Convention when St. Paul was the key city for the conventions being held that week. It had been 40 years since the last time this happened. For many of us, it was the only opportunity to hear a number of brothers who are of the governing body speak here in the Twin Cities. What a privilege to have those faithful anointed ones among us for a few days. I can still remember two of our beloved local anointed brothers, Russell Olson and Robert Morrison, both nearing 90, holding on to one another as they gingerly walked the corridor down to administration offices to visit with Brother Franz and the others. Brother Morrison had actually predated Brother Franz in the truth, though not quite as old. By this time, few of the anointed were left in the Twin Cities. However, as late as 1970 in the Riverside Congregation in Minneapolis, there were 13 of the anointed remaining, including Sister Alma Swenson, who had been baptized around 1900 and served faithfully until her death in 1976 at the age of 98. Since 1983, there has been much more growth, especially in the foreign language field. Ever since the 1910s and 20s, when each city had a Polish class, only English congregations were present here, although the brothers would frequently arrange for talks in various Scandinavian languages. But in 1994, the first Spanish language congregation was formed. This was a big decision, as prior to this, the thinking was to integrate rather than meet separately. But it was obviously Jehovah's direction. The growth has been rapid. Now there are several scattered around the cities. Also, we now see sign language, Hmong, and Russian congregations, in addition to a Vietnamese and French group, and no doubt others will soon be following. This account is by no means exhaustive. Some of the dates may be off by a year or two, as the memories of many are not so accurate after 60 or 70 years. If I had been a little more discerning as to the questions I would ask a number of years ago, I could have been more accurate. But most of those links with the past are now all gone. There seems to be no reason to put more recent events into writing as there are literally thousands of us who can recall the more recent theocratic past. We can take all these recent memories right with us into the new world. From the earliest records to the present is 120 years of theocratic history here in the Twin Cities. When W.E. Page began reading Zion's Watchtower in early 1887, he was the only subscriber. Now there are thousands of brothers and sisters as well as scores of congregations in numerous languages. There will continue to be increase because we know the Bible says of Christ's kingdom that it will eventually fill the whole earth. How much more we will see before Armageddon is not certain. But those of us who have seen the little one become a thousand right here in our home territory 
have reason to think appreciatively about the past and make it our determination to live up to the example and faith of those who truly pioneered this field long before we came on the scene. <laughs>